Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to to another in our in our series as we kind of uh, get ramped up here for the upcoming conference in May. Um, I'm going to kind of let people trickle in just a little bit longer. So we'll kind of chat a little in the meantime before we get started. Um, but this is just a reminder: we are doing, uh, you know, the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain is doing a three webinar series as our lead up to our our annual conference. In May this year, we have two exciting things about our annual conference. Well, it's more than two, but two I'll highlight. One is it's in Disney, so that's great. Uh, so we're very excited. We'll be at um, at the Disney's Grand Floridian Hotel, uh, which is going to be, I, I think, a really kind of a fun time. This was canceled originally due to COVID, so we get to now come back uh, all together again and kind of uh, forget those years, hopefully. Um, and then the other fun thing we're doing this year is we are doing a introduction to oral facial pain in general. Um, so it's, it's not only a conference that we have, uh, designed for, for just the specialists, but also for, um, anyone who wants to come in, learn, uh, a little bit about oral facial pain. Um, so we're excited for that, uh, as a, as a two day kind of, uh, starter conference. Uh, so we are, are hopeful that, uh, everyone can join us. But let me get us started today. Today's topic is, uh, epidemiology and impact of oral facial pain, most common oral facial pain disorders. And we have uh, Dr. Laurel Henderson leading us. So if you'll allow me to introduce Laurel very quickly here. Dr. Henderson is a graduate of the Herman Oscar School of Dentistry at the University of Southern California and has pursued triple, speciali spe triple specialization uh, in oral facial pain, oral medicine, and oral maxillofacial pathology. He's currently an oral medicine resident at the Brigham and Women's Hospital through Harvard School of Dental Medicine. And she holds a master's degree in health and strategic communication and served as Miss California, United States in 2019. After completing her training at Harvard, she plans to combine her passions for oral health and evidence-based health messaging by working as a professional oral health correspondent for a major broadcasting news channel. Laurel, I'm excited. Good morning. Welcome back. And I can't wait to hear what you have to say today. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Dr. Vaughn. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. I'm just going to share my screen so we can kick things off. Our topic today is going to be talking about just a little primer into oral facial pain, who is affected, what it does to their lives, how it changes their interactions with the world around them, and essentially what kind of tools a uh, you know, clinician would want to have in their toolkit to help most patients with oral facial pain uh, be getting a diagnosis. The treatment aspect, of course, will be covered at our next session by Dr. Klasser. And I would be completely remiss if I didn't say this is a very hard act to follow. Obviously, we had a wonderful presentation uh, last time with Dr. Okison. And I have right next to me both Dr. Okison and Dr. Klasser's book that I use definitely as foundations to my knowledge. And are um, they're very evidence-based and really easy to read. And I encourage everybody, if you're interested in learning an oral facial pain, these uh Webinars are a great place to start. Going to the meeting is a great place to start. And certainly these books are a great place to start. So onward we go. Oh, there we go. So our agenda for today is to talk about the epidemiology of oral facial pain conditions, highlight some of the key literature that has illuminated the area of epidemiology, uh, talk about the cost and impact of oral facial pain, the monetary cost, the social cost, and really the impact on society. Talk about how to do a proper history and physical exam when a patient's in your office. Uh, talk about the 10 most common uh, oral facial pain conditions. And then finally, give you some important clinical pearls so you don't miss important diagnoses. You don't send the wrong person to the wrong place. And you know, the appropriate interdisciplinary care that can help these patients. So our first topic is going to be the epidemiology of oral facial pain. I love this quote from the famous Dr. Sir William, William Osler that says, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. I take this very seriously with health communication that you know, I don't talk about cases, I talk about patients. I try to engage in narrative medicine where we discuss the patient's story so that you know, even if you've never met the person, you really understand what they're going through and what brought them to the clinic today. And I encourage you to um, kind of think about the person first and the disease second, if you can. As always, we like to talk about the biopsychosocial model of pain that kind of encompasses not just injury, but the way that a patient um, encompass or, um, deals with their injury or pain that's based upon their um, social upbringing, how their family has dealt with uh, trauma in the past, what kind of stressors they're going through, uh, their prior traumatic events, whether they've had a lot of pain in the past, their coping skills, 
their fear about getting treatment or about certain kinds of practitioners, um, their biology, whether they have genetic changes, whether they have tissue injury, um, and then, of course, their cultural and spiritual pro- um, factors. Many people who have spiritual beliefs that um, encourage coping have a different uh, presentation than spiritual beliefs that talk about, you know, life should be pain-free. So we talk about uh, epidemiology really with this beautiful article that was funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, it's a large cohort study that's a prospective evaluation of patients, about 3,200 patients uh, that were pain-free, TMD-free, um, and then they followed them for a period of years, about seven years. And this was done in four separate locations across the United States. And by following these patients, uh, there is an ability to track who was going to get oral facial pain conditions, TMD conditions, and who wasn't. And the findings that were very important from this you know, kind of landmark uh, research is that about 4% of the population develops TMD each year. And the highest prevalence seems to be around young middle-aged folks. The lowest prevalence is in younger folks. And it is a highly female-driven, um, both gender and sex-driven um, condition. <clears throat> we seem to see that there's more chronic pain in non-Hispanic whites, um, but incidence can be higher in African-Americans. <clears throat> this is also lower than Asian Americans. There can be chronic overlapping pain conditions or COPCs that can also be factors that can uh, kind of give you an in- insight if the patient is going to have a TMD in the future. So if the patient has a history of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, GERD, IBS, sensitivity to chemicals, PTSD, chronic low back pain, pain in other areas of their body, including their genitals and the reproductive tract headaches, and cystitis, you can certainly have more pain conditions. In my training, one of the best um, quotes that we used to bandy around quite a bit is, the best way to predict the future is to look at the past. So if a patient has had refractory pain conditions in the past, they may have refractory oral facial pain in the future. The OPERA findings uh, gave us three groups of patients that were helpful for us to understand who is going to do well with patient uh, pain and who is not going to do so well. The first group was labeled the adaptive group, had less severe pain, less psychological dis- distress, less muscle pain sensitivity, and the pain was typically localized um, to the area of complaint with very few overlapping distant pain sites or chronic pain conditions. Men were more common than women in this group. In the second group, this group was more sensitive to pain. Um, they had more muscle pain, they had more psychological stress, and more um, overlapping pain conditions compared to the first group. And this group had slightly more women than men. In the final group, these were global symptoms patients that had most severe pain and dysfunction. They had more tender pain uh, sites um, and many more chronic overlapping pain conditions. They had the greatest degree of psychological distress, including anxiety and depression. They had less ability to control their cardiovascular function, their heart rate. They had a history of jaw injury and traumatic life events, a history of smoking, and were much more commonly women than men. This is a really interesting schematic that um, the cohort put together that helps kind of discuss the uh, in- intersectionality of pain and the way that it can manifest. So at the bottom here, we see that we have different genetic um, changes that can happen in patients, and these can be very much intertwined with each other. And these receptors can be um, upregulated. You can have more of them. They can be more difficult to turn off. You can be more sensitive to pain. You can also have a dysregulation of your receptors that help with mental health. So you can have a dysregulation of mood and anxiety, and certainly you can have uh, altered stress response. So by understanding some of these genetic changes, you can then predict sort of what kind of psychological state patients will be in, what kind of pain state they're in. And given this foundation of higher distress um, psychologically and higher pain sensation, patients have the like perfect stage to develop painful TMDs. So not all patients will have these sorts of translocations or genetic changes, but it may um, predict um, or may give higher... um, predictive value to having painful TMDs in the future. You can see also on the side that there are environmental contributions, which again are similar to our biopsychosocial model. So again, the you know, cultural beliefs, the social environment a person is in, if they've had physical events, that can contribute to their likelihood of developing TMDs. 
And then this isn't pictured here, but there is a third axis of pain. And certainly the development of PMDs does increase with time um, to a point. So we saw that like highest um, pain age range was about 30s to 40s. This is another uh, cohort study that was about um, 180,000 patients uh, that were studied um, in Sweden, and they had very similar results. This is quite a large cohort, but essentially seeing that there's a significant gender difference um, in the presence of pain and the chronicity of pain across the uh, population. And they bring a really interesting um, discussion to the table of why. Is it truly sex or is it gender as well? And of course, there is a sex influence of you know, estrogen. There seems to be um, more pain associated in ro rodent models as well, that female rodents happen to have more pain sensitivity, more pain uh, responses. But there's also a gender component. And it is noticed in um, some literature that you know, the way that we're socialized to uh, present pain can be different across genders. So we ask ourselves, okay, who seeks help? Who really is suffering the most? Typically, the, in the general population, about 13% of the general population have masticatory muscle pain. 16% can have disc uh, derangement. 9% can have TMJ pain disorders. But only about 3 to 7% seek treatment. And, you know, that can be related to social conditioning and gender. Again, treatment-seeking behavior may be um, a social construct that, you know, women are taught more to seek pain. Um, you know, men are maybe sometimes asked to, you know, suck it up, that sort of thing. Uh, there seems to be that in uh, countries that there is more gender equality in, um, you know, the, the monetary aspect, the job aspect, the family aspect, there seems to be better health outcomes. And whether that's something that as a sociologist might want to look into in the future is very interesting. I put this book on the side, which I think is very interesting. Um, the role of trauma in pain is incredibly important. Uh, it changes the way that we we see our life and the see those around us. Trauma can be physical, but it also can be emotional. Uh, tra physical trauma can be micro traumas from day to day living, overuse of muscles, uh, loss of loading of the joint. It can also be uh, macro, macro trauma. So an accident, whether it's a physical altercation or a motor vehicle accident, or possibly even indirect, so what a whiplash uh, injury, that's also important trauma. So emotional trauma is important too. Patients can seem to um, feel pain more when they feel like they're not having um, good treatment by others. So you know, they display more pain behaviors, they have more uh, treatment-seeking behaviors when they have emotional trauma as well. And conversely, they might also feel like they you know, uh, don't trust dentists or don't trust medical professionals if they've been um, kind of set down this path, not getting the appropriate treatment over time. We'll talk about medical gaslighting a little bit. This is an article that I find very, very helpful. It's kind of in the intersection of law and medicine and ethics. And it brings a really important idea up that there seems to be a bias against women in the treatment of pain. We see this a lot in emergency departments with women presenting with a concern about having, you know, a possible myocardial infarction. And depending on the provider that they see, they may not get the appropriate testing done. They may be told, oh, you're just having a panic attack. You know, we're just going to send you home with some, you know, NSAIDs and tell you to do some deep breathing. And some other providers say, well, I think I've seen that before. You can have some um, jaw pain related to, you know, myocardial infarction. You can have GI upset, you know, gastroesophageal reflux with um, uh, in presenting in women that can be myocardial infarction fine. So why don't we run some troponins? Why don't we do an EKG on you? Let's test you a little bit more. So this framework that we have that women are um, exacerbating or um, showing more pain um, behaviors can sometimes delay their treatment or delay their diagnosis. There is also a concept that women feel pain more, possibly because of their physiologic pain related to menstruation. Unlike men who don't have physiologic pain to expect um, from a certain age, women do a lot of internal um, um, viewing or um, checking their symptoms, seeing, you know, is this pain that is normal or is this pain that's abnormal? And they seek treatment if it doesn't feel like it's normal pain where men maybe don't have that same um, self-surveying behavior. 
This is another very interesting article from 2022, a Scandinavian cohort, um, looks through 20, or sorry, 19 European countries and tried to see again the gender inequalities in pain. And again, uh, reported the similar findings that we've seen before that women seem to feel pain more. They seem to feel it at higher levels and they seem to seek treatment more. So what does this mean for us as clinicians, as providers to patients? Well, we need to realize that this impacts their lives significantly. It impacts the lives of the people who are dealing with the pain, it impacts the lives of the people around those patients and society in total. Uh, there's a study that showed that patients with moderate pain pay about $4,500 more annually uh, in healthcare costs compared to those with no pain. So it significantly impacts their day-to-day -day finances. Uh, across the United States, the cost is about $500 billion annually. And this is more than the cost of heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. This uh, cost can also be shown in the loss of work. People feel so much pain that they don't go into work. They're not able to work at their highest level, so there's decreased productivity. And there needs to be a disability benefits given for some patients because they're unable to continue work. And certainly healthcare expenses, including seeing primary care, seeing emergency departments, seeing specialist care, multiple specialist care, um, doing procedural tests, um, doing appliances, all sorts of things that can add up in the bills for these patients. In addition to um, uh, what we know from the Journal of Pain, we also have a new article that just came out of the Journal, De Journal of Dental Research, Clinical and Re Translational Research called the DEEP Study that model outcomes for patients with uh, persistent oral facial pain. And they noted that for patients who have high pain, they have even more pain or money that they have to spend, so about $265 more every six months for that high pain level. But they also modeled through some incredible economic modeling that, frankly, is above my understanding, <laughs> that for patients who are 25 onwards for the rest of their life, they will typically spend about $32,000 on their care for oral facial pain alone. And this expenditure of $32,000 will only result in about 18 years of perfect health. So it is a very rocky road. It is chronic and persistent and difficult for these patients, and it can be incredibly disabling and impactful to them. And that is possibly related to misdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis, inaccurate treatment plans, and uh, incorrect treatment plans. Uh, there's also a probability of staying in high pain for the next six months in about 65% of patients. So again, you know, having accurate diagnosis from the beginning may help benefit these patients in their journey to get out of pain. Additionally, there's a social cost for chronic pain. These patients can notice that they don't want to socialize as much, that, you know, they feel like they have to cancel plans because their pain is significant. Um, Eating in public can be very difficult, especially if they have an audible click going on. I've had many patients report to me that, you know, I'm fine. I don't feel pain, but I feel like people, you know, they, they get uncomfortable when they hear this sound. They may also have difficulty with physical intimacy. There's obviously a lot of physical acts that involve the head and neck area, and that can be difficult for relationships. Finally, there can be a loss of confidence in medical and dental professionals if diagnoses are missed or delayed. So for patients, when we see them for the first time, we really want to try to do our best to get to the bottom of a good diagnosis for them. That all starts with the question of how can I help you today and keeping it very open-ended. Many patients, if you listen long enough, will tell you exactly what's wrong with them. But while we're looking at them, we're hearing their story, we're really connecting with them, we're also looking at their nonverbal cues. Um, you know, looking at what they're doing. Are they an anxious sort of person? Are they chewing their lips? Are they, you know, clenching their jaws? Are they wringing their hands? Are they biting their nails? Uh, are they doing things that tell you that they might have maladaptive coping behaviors, parafunctional habits? And then I really like to categorize people, if I can, to try to help myself understand, okay, how can I, how can I almost win them over? How can I make them feel comfortable with what's going on today, that they're in the right place? And I try to say, okay, this patient is feeling very anxious or they're in a lot of pain. Maybe they're very angry because they've had inappropriate treatments in the past. Maybe they feel very distrustful. Maybe they've had multiple uh, treatments by other providers and their pain has not been managed appropriately. And given those kind of um, categories, then I'm able to help 
kind of um, tailor my conversation with them, decreasing their anxiety, decreasing their pain and their anger, you know, saying, you know, I'm, I, I will try my very best not to cause more pain. I'm going to be very conservative with you. We're not going to do any procedures unless completely warranted. Uh, these frameworks help have a very therapeutic interaction for patients. Oftentimes, I notice that uh, it's less about what we do and the more about how we do it. Uh, I'm a big proponent of trauma-informed care, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that looks like for patients. So uh, with our patients, we want to be asking specific questions. This is a great table from Dr. Classler's book, uh, which talks about how to have a proper oral history with patients. We talk about, you know, when did it start? Where is it? I always like patients to touch with one finger to show me. Sometimes they say, oh, I'll hear, I'll hear. But one finger is a lot easier to differentiate. Okay, possibly is it muscle? Is it joints? Is it nerve? Inside, outside, that's very helpful. What is the intensity, zero to 10? How bad is it? What is the duration? Has it been just like this since the very beginning? Or is it only for a couple of seconds? How frequent is it? Are there times that it goes away or does it change over time? Maybe it's worse in the afternoon versus the morning. Does anything make you feel better? Like is putting an ice pack on the area or avoiding hard foods? Those make you feel better. And have you had any prior treatment? How many doctors have you seen for this condition? What have they done for you? How successful was it? In the medical history, we definitely want to be looking at pre-existing conditions like those overlapping chronic pain conditions. Ask about sleep. Are you having restorative, refreshing sleep? Are you sleeping poorly? Is there a possibility that you're having any sort of um, sleep breathing disorders like obstructive sleep apnea where you're not, you're getting many hours of sleep, but you're not getting good quality sleep? Have you ever been hospitalized or had surgeries for this? Have you ever had trauma? What, what started all of this? If you say it happened May 1st, 2019, well, what happened on May 1st, 2019? What happened on April 30th, 2019? What medications are working for you? What does not work for you? Do you have any allergies or any substance use um, uh, history? Some patients who have substance use history do speak very openly about it. And, you know, I understand for some people it may be uncomfortable asking these questions, but it can be very helpful. Also, a history of dental pain, previous treatments. If you had dental pain, you know, did it get better with the treatment or did the pain start after a dental treatment. That kind of chronicity, that timeline is very helpful to understand. If you feel like you are the person that gets all of the problems with treatment, you're the person who, you know, if you take a medication, are you going to have all of the side effects? It's very important. Are you putting anything in your mouth that's not food? Do you put fingernails in your mouth? Do you use coffee stirs? Do you put guitar picks in there? Knowing that if you have extra little habits, how they affect are very important. If you've ever had any sort of uh, night guard made for you or appliance, what does that look like? Can I see it? Can I touch it? Are there any wear marks in it? Is it appropriately adjusted to you? Is it comfortable? And then, of course, a psychological history. And I know that this can be very difficult for some patients and some providers to talk about. I usually like to start this question with, on a scale of 0 to 10, how bad is your stress right now? I feel that um, for many patients, giving more of an objective score can be a nice entree. And so if they say, okay, my, my stress is a four out of 10 right now, you say, okay, is this how it's always been? Is it usually a zero or is it usually, you know, an eight and it's better than usual? That'll help give you a little bit of insight. If it's a little bit worse than usual, you can say, well, what are you going through right now? What do you think the stress is from? How do you manage your stress? Do you have appropriate stress um, reduction behaviors or stress management behaviors? Are you doing things that are really not helpful to you when you're stressed out? And then definitely, do you have any litigation going on? Do you have any concerns about um, people doing wrong by you? Something has gone wrong in your past by somebody else. So for our physical examination, I always recommend a very gentle, thorough, and well-narrated exam. This is done, I always try to do a really hot, you know, hand wash beforehand. I want people to see that I am a clean person. Just assume everybody is a clean freak. They want to see that you care, that you're very thorough. And I narrate in a system-based approach. So the very first thing that I do for patients is I ask their permission before I touch them. I assume every single one of my patients has gone through a traumatic 
event. It's almost ubiquitous in our culture, whether it's from you know childhood, whether it's an injury, whether it's something that happened in a dental office or with an intimate partner. It's again ubiquitous in our society. So I want to treat patients as if they were fragile, as if they were my friends, as if they were my family members, that they should be treated very gently. I start by touching the patient's hand to show them how I'm going to touch them. I look at their hands. I look at the nails. I look for any sort of sign of, you know, chewing of their nails, any sort of hemorrhages on their nails, any sort of biting of the cuticle. I also look, just because I'm a pathologist, I like to look at the palms, see if there's any changes, any sort of roughening of the palm, pitting, things like that. I look at the joint too to see if there's any sign of arthritic change, whether, you know, there's sensitivity or mobility uh, when I, you know, touch like a, a more inflamed uh, joint. I also do a hypermobility uh, examination for the patient. So that's a, the Biden hypermobility scale. And that means I'm pulling back on the fingers. I'm pulling back on the thumbs the arms. I'm trying to see if there's hyperextensibility of the joints. This is particularly useful in young people to rule out any sort of connective tissue disease or hypermobility condition. And then once I've touched their hands, showing them the pressure that I'm going to be touching with them with, saying this is a standardized amount of pressure I'm going to be touching with your face, do you feel like this is painful to you today? If they have pain on this distal site, which is pretty irregular, then I know that they're probably going to have more pain overall. And I'm going to say, okay, above this on the face, you need to let me know. So our standardized, standardized amount of pressure that we touch on the face is about two kilograms. And we touch for about two seconds on the muscles, two seconds of sustained pressure. So I show them that on their hand. I say, this is what you should expect. And that way I'm not coming in, you know, surprising them in any way. I also show them on the back of their elbow, how I touch the joint. And again, this is typically not a painful joint. Um, I say, okay, if you feel anything more than this, please do let me know. So again, from Dr. Klasser's wonderful book, um, this is a nice systems-based examination of patients going through the head and neck, going through the just general skin, the consistency, looking for any swelling, any asymmetry, palpating the muscles, going through the muscles of mastication, particularly the deep and superficial masseters, the temporalis. Uh, we go through the uh, uh, sternocleidomastoid, the splenius capitis. We try to do the trapezius as well. Um, the posterior digastricus can be important too. We check the temporal mandibular joint area, touching on the lateral surfaces and the posterior surfaces of the joint. We see range of motion of the neck, range of motion of the mouth. We listen to the joint try to feel and see if there's any sign of crepitation or sandy sounds in there that might say there's a, a structural change, that it's not as smooth moving anymore. We do possibly loading of the joint as well. We note that if there's any changes that are tender, swelling, heat, erythema as well, redness. Cranial nerve exam is also very important for mapping out conditions. So if a patient feels like they have numbing or tingling or um, any sort of off feeling with the nerves, we might actually want to physically map out the area and take a picture of that for future reference to say, okay, it's expanding, it's contracting, or it's about the same. We want to also check the temporal and car carotid arteries, just make sure that there's no additional changes there. Inspecting the ears and nose can be important, especially a lot of pain can feel like it's in the ear. Um, obviously, not everybody is an otolaryngologist here or otorhinolaryngologist. Um, but just making sure that there's no obvious um, changes associated with, you know, a growth in the ear, an infection in the ear, a foreign object in the ear, and the same with the nose, that can be very helpful. Finally, we look at the oral soft tissue and hard tissue. I like to look at the soft tissues in great detail because I'm an oral medicine, oral pathology person as well. And that can mean palpating the glands, feeling for any sort of obstruction, looking for any sort of purulence coming out of the glands. I like to look at the teeth as well and see if there are any wear facets on the teeth, if there seems to be any um, uh, attrition changes, what the bite looks like as well, if the patient seems to be holding in different position, if they have um, different bites that they're kind of jumping around to. Additional tests that we can do for the patients include functional tests of joint loading. Uh, so we can have patients biting on separators. Uh, we can have them... Um, telling us if we have more pain on the contralateral side or the ipsilateral side. 
holding open for 60 seconds and having the patient tell you where the pain is referring, clenching for 60 seconds, telling you where the patient is referring. Ordering additional imaging, like an open mouth panoramic radiograph, can be helpful for some patients, but certainly it's not necessary for all. Um, the CBCT, or a small field um, CT scan, can be helpful for examining the architecture of the temporomandibular joint. And certainly an MRI can be helpful for examining the closed and open mouth positions to see the um, disc and condyle relationship if there seems to be a disc derangement. Finally, for testing the nerves, we can do anesthetic challenges. So we can place either a topical anesthetic or local anesthetic in an area, possibly seeing if we can block the pain that a patient feels. So now we're getting into the good stuff here. This is, of course, Dr. Okison's incredible um, uh, schematics from his uh, text and also from his paper showing the kind of access one and access two conditions the patients can have. We, of course, do not have enough time to go through all of that today, but I will give you a, a brief overview of the 10 most common conditions that you will probably see and um, be concerned about in your patients. We'll go through the TMDs, including muscle pain, um, joint pain, and then joint uh, alterations that can include disc displacement. We'll look at migraine, post-traumatic uh, trigeminal neuropathy, which is a painful nerve condition associated with the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal neuralgia, which is a very uncommon nerve condition, like almost like a seizure of the nerve. And then finally, burning mouth syndrome, which I see probably every single day in my oral medicine or facial pain practice. And I'm sure many of you have seen as well, which can be very frustrating for patients and for clinicians, but is very high yield if the patients are triaged appropriately. So for myalgia and myofascial pain, the way I describe this to patients, myo meaning muscle, alga meaning al, get your finger off there, that's muscle pain. Myofascial pain is muscle and fascia or connective tissue. Myalgia is more of an acute pain. Myofascial pain can be more of a chronic type pain. And this can be related to jaw function, jaw movement, parafunction, the overuse of the muscles. I usually can um, assess if the patient is going to have more muscle use by asking them to clench and asking them to show me kind of their muscle bulk. Some patients have kind of flabby, loose muscles. And then some people, when you ask them to clench and you touch their masseters or their temporalis, you're like, wow, that is a very strong muscle right there. You're clearly using it. I almost compare it to like doing bicep curls all day long. Somebody who's working out all day long is going to have a very toned, strong muscle. Myalgia is a localized pain. So when you press on a muscle site, if you feel an area where the patient relates that they have pain, you press on it with two kilograms of force for two seconds, the patient will say that their pain stays underneath their finger. This is a moderate intensity pain, and it's a local pain. This pain can then turn chronic and can actually change um, to a more um, like neuromuscular type of pain in myofascial pain. Myofascial pain can start as a taut band, so a tightening of the muscle band, injury to the muscle, that can be hyperactive, uh, difficult to turn off pain. It can have local radiation, just like a sunburst in the area. So if you press on that area with that amount of pain, it gives you a local spread. Or there can be myofascial pain with referral. If you press on the area in a more distant site, like a different muscle, or the eye or a tooth can feel pain. And each of these can be very important pain for these patients. Again, myofascial pain is a chronic neuromuscular pain that's related to hyper-excitable motor nerve end plates. The way that I describe this to patients is I, when I think about muscles underneath a, a microscope, I think of them almost like little slinkies. They can expand and they can contract. And sometimes when we overuse them and we're stretching our slinky too much, sometimes you can get a little snarl in our slinky. And that little knot there can be very palpable underneath our finger. We feel, most patients can feel that in their shoulders, they have this taut muscle a bundle, and it can radiate pain when you touch that area. And many um, patients notice that it feels like a dull, deep pressure pain. Uh, this is kind of like our, our typical you know, muscle and joint pain it seems to be more dull, and it's not as sharp or as um, bright um, or as acute feeling as some um, nerve pain. Again, it can refer to a different anatomical site. And when pressing on the area, there can be a local muscle twitch from the amount of pain the patients have. Um, so again, when I 
when I'm searching through a patient's muscles, I go very systematically. So I have one supporting hand on one side of the face. I have one finger that is applying the pressure. And I start at the inferior border of the mandible for the, if we're doing the superficial masseter. I'm going to feel across the muscle. And when I feel kind of like a, a taut harp string, I then start going up along those taut bands there. And when I go across the taut bands, you can usually start to feel a little concentration of um, muscle fibers that feels like a little knot. That's going to be an area where you want to apply your pressure and then elicit a response from the patient. It should be something that the patient has felt before it feels uh, familiar for the patient. It replicates the complaint. Obviously, the patient can have more than one type of pain at once, so they can have myofascial pain in addition to joint pain. So this can help you go, again, system by system, saying, okay, in addition to joint pain, you also have muscle pain. And if it is a muscle pain, it's this type of muscle pain. And, you know, Dr. Klasser will be talking about different ways that we treat different kinds of pains in the mouth next time. Patients who overuse their masticatory muscles may also have tension-type headaches. This little schematic on the right side here shows the usual distribution of tension-type headaches. They can be in this kind of hat band distribution where the temporalis muscles are. They can be across the forehead and then down the neck, down the cheeks as well. Again, moderate intensity, dull, achy feeling, typically bilateral, and they can be relieved by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And these patients are able to go about their day. They don't necessarily have to lay down and, you know, quit work or quit what they're doing. It's kind of an annoying pain. And the uh, chronicity of the pain is that it seems to be worse as the day progresses. More use of the muscles during the day, more activation, uh, more pain response in that area. For arthralgias, which is specifically joint pain, so arth meaning joint, algia meaning al, get your finger off there, joint pain. Uh, this can be related to trauma, whether macro trauma, again, direct trauma, you get a punch to the face, you get a volleyball to the face, uh, indirect trauma like whiplash injuries, or micro trauma, like chewing things that are, you know, day to day, on a day to day basis, lots of hard, crunchy things. If you just switched over to a raw diet, you might have a little more joint pain than you're used to. You can also have pain with um, hyperextension of the jaw. So some people, when they open really big, they might hear a little click or pop, and then that also might be associated with pain as well. That's related to the anatomy of the joint. So each patient has a um, relationship between the bones of their jaw. So the temples and the mandible together are the temporomandibular joint, and those two bones the condyle and the temporal fossa um, are separated by a disc. And that disc is a biconcave disc that has four ligaments on each side. The posterior ligament is important because it is the ligament that has blood supply and nerves. And when opening large or when loading the joint quite a bit, it's possible to have that disc move slightly out of position that's typical and maybe possibly injure the posterior ligament that can cause inflammation, swelling, pain for patients. So pain that's specific to the joint may be related to trauma, like from opening really big, somebody had a really big, you know, bite of a Chipotle burrito or something, or they had a really big bite of an apple, they kind of traumatized that area, and now it's a little bit sore afterwards. And the pain is specifically in the area of the jaw, the temple, in front of the ear, and inside the ear on palpation. The pain is altered with jaw movement, so meaning that certain um, functions make the pain worse. Biting on things that are hard makes the pain worse. Pair function makes the pain worse. When touching on the joint, we use a little bit less pressure than what we use when touching the muscles, as it's easier to expel, elicit pain. On the lateral pull, the joint, we typically do um, a half a kilogram of pressure, and around the lateral pull is a one kilogram of pressure. Now, many patients will come to our office and say, I have a clicking joint or I have concern about my joint being in the wrong place. Doctor, can you do something for me? I'm worried I'm broken. And that's typically not something that needs to be fixed. Many people have clicking of their joints without any sort of limitations, uh, no walking of their joints, no pain of their joints. It's just part of their natural presentation. And that doesn't necessarily need to be fixed. In fact, 35% of the general population when studied had a displaced disc on MRI, and many patients didn't really feel the need to seek treatment about it. 
the way I had it described to you when I was in residency is that, you know, how many of us, when we bend down our knees, make a sound? Probably many of us. Is it something we see treatment for? Not commonly. Many people are more excited about this because they can hear it. It's really close to their ear. They think, oh, maybe something's broken. Maybe I broke a bone in there. I don't know what it is. But for most patients, all we have to do for them is educate them that, you know, essentially this is not a problem until it is impairing your function or you have pain. So for patients who do have a clicking joint, this can be related to stretching of those ligaments. Again, we have that biconcave disc that is surrounded by ligaments, ligaments being like little rubber bands in the joint. And if you stretch a rubber band, it can go back to shape. Or if you stretch it really, really far, it might actually get longer than usual. And the longer those ligaments are, the easier the movement is of that uh, disc within that joint. And the easier it is for the disc to get jammed in the joint or to click in the joint, get a pressure that's different than usual. So a clicking sensation or a clicking sound typically is a stick slip phenomenon. I'm trying to make a click sound. There we go. Stick slip phenomenon within the joint. So it's a sticky pressure on that disc and then slipping off of it. And typically that happens during the loading of the joint. Um, eating things that are hard or crunchy. Um, it's not typically a problem for most patients, but it may be acutely tender right around the time that, that first injury happens. Or if the patient never had enough time to um, recover from that and they keep re-injuring themselves. So say they opened really big, it feels a little bit tender, and then they keep eating big bites of sandwiches or keep yelling really loud on a big concert, they may re-injure themselves a little bit. Again, for most patients, a lot of, um, uh, without pain, this is not something that we necessarily need to be treating. Most patients have a perfectly fine range of motion unless they have arthralgia. If they have arthralgia, there may be a little bit of muscle guarding. They may be trying to avoid re-injuring themselves a little bit. For patients with disc displacement without reduction, that means that their disc has moved out of a position and now it's not coming back into position. And there are some patients that can kind of live between these two diagnoses of disc displacement with reduction, disc displacement without reduction, and we call that intermittent locking. So some patients will notice I get a lock every once in a while, I can't close my mouth, can't open my mouth very well, but I can do this little procedure where if I just move my jaw side to side, I can seem to kind of wiggle around it, and then it can come back. Or if I really, really relax my muscles, I seem to be able to get myself back in position. For these patients, again, we definitely want to discourage, you know, a lot of procedures for them. We want to be talking about function, right? So if patients are able to function adequately in their lives, we want to do less rather than more. If they're able to eat and drink, they're able to laugh and talk, less is more. Certainly, surgical interventions are something that I'm sure Dr. Claster will be talking about in our next lecture. But typically speaking for this patient, these patients, limited range of motion is going to be their primary um, concern, and they would like to be returned back to that um, ability to open their mouth, put a fork in their mouth, um, be able to talk and laugh without pain. And that'll be very important for deciding how to treat these patients. Again, there can be a little bit of luxation that the patients can do, and then sometimes in the acute setting, patients will come to your office or to the emergency department with the inability to open or close. And we might have to do some assisted manipulation to help get them out of that acute uh, lock that they have. So something that can be associated with uh, joint problems, pain or not pain, can be degenerative joint disease. So over time, patients may have um, a lot of use of their joints, which may have over um, adaptive remodeling. So this means a slow process of changing the, the architecture in the joint to deal with the new normal that the patient has. This may appear on a radiograph as flattening of the condyle. So instead of being a nice round shape, they're a little bit flatter. Over time, you might have a little protrusion of the condyle that looks like an osteophyte. You can see down here, this little protrusion down here. That can be another um, adaptive remodeling change that you see. And then occasionally if that osteophyte gets a little bit larger, it can actually separate, uh, it can get clicked off, and that can be um, in the joint space, something called a joint mouse, which can limit range of motion, can be sometimes challenging for patients. Sometimes when we um, do auscultation of the joints, we can notice dry joint sounds. Uh, patients who have less 
lubrication of their joint by their synovial membrane may be more likely to have a little bit of adaptive remodeling. They might have a little bit more of that thick slip phenomenon in their joint. And we might recommend um, some changes to increase lubrication of their joint. Overall, though, if patients just have this radiographic finding, we typically don't need to do interventions for them. However, if they have the clinical signs and symptoms of displacement without reduction, or if they have arthralgia, that would be a reason to intervene. On the contrary, arthritis is an option. So this is a pathologic remodeling of the joint. You can see this is not an, a really good open mouth radiograph, but you can see within these joint spaces here, we have this kind of moth-eaten appearance of the condyles. And even of the faucet may be possible that there can be some changes as well. There can be flattening of the condyles, pain, crepitation, or a sandy sound. There can be overlying skin, redness, heat, swelling. And it may be difficult for patients to put their back teeth together as well. And this can be a slow process or it can be a very quick process for patients. Particularly in young patients, we worry about um, rheumatoid arthritis for them. And if you see a young person with kind of these dissolving joints, it is definitely a good reason to get further workup with your rheumatology colleagues or official pain colleagues um, who feel comfortable with these kinds of patients uh, because it is a uh, you know, important uh, condition to monitor and to treat appropriately. Um, the patient can feel you know, pain associated with this or these can be changes that happened many years ago. Sometimes we test this by doing pain on biting. So we put a separator like a tongue blade between the teeth the pain can be increased by biting on the separator on the opposite side, and it can be decreased by biting on the separator on the same side. This is just a nice little uh, image of the joint, CBCT, that shows this um, kind of degenerative change, loss of that beautiful white fluorotic cortical border of the joint. Um, it definitely has kind of a, a moth-eaten or a, a sandy appearance to it, and that gives you kind of an idea of why you would hear a sandy sound in the joint. It's just going to be kind of scratchy and dry and unfortunately remodeling in a maladaptive way. All right, moving on. Our next topic is migraine. <clears throat> migraine is very common amongst um, patients that we see. It's usually young women. It can be very, very common um, in the high school, college, and young adult years. Typically, it's about 18% of women, um, and the peak is about ages 35 to 45, which is what we see typically with our other TMD conditions. This is a neurovascular condition, so it's both electrical signals and also um, the vessels receiving more blood, so more um, dilation of the vessels. Patients to be a migraineur have to have at least five attacks, each lasting several hours. They have a unilateral sensation, typically with a pulsatile quality. It can be moderate to severe, aggravated by physical activity, meaning that it can be disabling for patients. So they can't really go on with their day to day because they have to go lay down and have to um, rest during that time. It can be very um, frustrating for patients because they just want to get on with their life, but it can be very disabling. Some patients have aura and they can have associated nausea, photophobia, and phonophobia. In children, interestingly, boys are slightly more affected than uh, girls, and there can be more GI symptoms within children. So asking about upset stomach is very important. There's a strong familial association with migraines. Um, in some twin studies, I believe it's like 60% um, heritability, like, uh, 40 to 70% heritability with uh, migraines, so very high heritability. And for many patients, uh, getting that diagnosis can be um, sometimes tricky because if they're a little bit older in age, maybe it doesn't fit all the criteria very perfectly. There seems to be um, an overlap continuum with chronic daily headache. So it starts out very severe intensity and then maybe, you know, more frequent, but less intense as the patient gets older. So having a headache diary or a migraine diary will be helpful for many uh, practitioners to understand the nature of these conditions. Um, and also for patients to understand the nature of their condition as well. You know, the severity, the kinds of um, improvement with medications. Many patients don't feel like um, simple ibuprofen is uh, benefiting them. So they like to, you know, possibly seek pharmacologic intervention by an orofacial pain specialist or by a neurologist. All right, moving on, we have post-traumatic trigeminal neuropathy or PTTN. 
So this is a change in nerve sensation related to trauma within the trigeminal region. This can be a sensation of weakness, pins and needles, itching, burning, annoying. You'll note this is very different than the sensation that we have with muscle and joint pain. I ask every patient, what kind of words can you use to describe your pain? Is it dull, achy, electric, stabby, throbby, burny, itchy? Does it feel like an ice pick? Does it feel hot? Give me all the words you can. And by giving patients lots of pain words to describe um, their sensations, um, it can be very helpful for them. Uh, for some patients, they can have an increased sensitivity to pain uh, with increased sensitivity to normal touch sensation and also increased sensitivity to um, uh, painful touch and then also increased sensitivity to a normal response. So patients who have this sensation usually have had prior trauma in the area and that usually in the oral facial region can be in multiple dental treatments. So a classic example that we have is a patient comes in with a hot tooth to their dentist, something feels wrong in the area, it's painful, uh, they undergo a procedure, the pain doesn't get better, um, then they have a serial dental treatment with a tooth next to it, that doesn't get better, then they start pulling teeth, then they start doing implants in the area, and the more manipulation in the area seems to be related with more likelihood of developing um, this trigeminal neuropathy, the neuropathic pain of the, in the trigeminal region. Um, this uh, type of pain, it can be either peripherally mediated or centrally mediated. So peripherally mediated conditions can be typically managed by addressing the peripheral nerve. The patients who have chronic pain conditions may have increased central sensitization. So they have a firing of their central nerve um, condition, sorry, central nerve system that means that they can't turn off their pain symptoms so well. They're just fired up or wound up. And these patients can't be addressed by just uh, dealing with the, the, the peripheral nerve. The central nerve or the, the CNS basically has to be addressed with that. I'm sure Dr. Klasser will talk about this next time. One of the tests that we can do to try to uh, figure out if the patient has a peripheral sensitization versus a central sensitization is by doing an anesthetic challenge test. And this is a schematic that we used at USC when I was in my training that is multiple lines. Sometimes we don't like to say like zero to 10 because sometimes patients try to like subdivide it and say, okay, it's like a 6.5 versus a 4.5. Sometimes we think of it more as just like a volume scale. So like this is absolutely quiet over here. This is the loudest it possibly could be. And we ask them to mark their pain prior to giving anesthesia. So we have them say, okay, where, how are you feeling today? If it's really, really bad, okay, they're going to mark here with a single slash. Then what we do is we fold the piece of paper over so it's hidden from their view and we administer the anesthesia. So it's possible we just do benzocaine or we might even do lidocaine injections to the area. We try to block that nerve to see if it's, uh, it benefits from local anesthetic. And we test over time to see if it responds. So we say, after three minutes, how do you feel? So we fold the paper again. After six minutes, how do you feel? And if the nerve seems to respond to benzocaine, that makes us feel very, very good about having a peripheral nerve sensitization. If the patient doesn't respond very well to um, benzocaine, then we say, okay, after six minutes, then we're going to do either an infiltration or a block of the site, and we're going to try to get the pain down further and further. If a patient doesn't respond to a block or to um, anesthetic in general, then we're really concerned about a centrally mediated process that might need to be managed with centrally acting medication. Uh, second to last, we're moving at a, a quick clip today. Uh, we're doing trigeminal neuralgia. And again, this is a diagnosis that I have found to be given far too frequently. Um, I think many people, when they hear tri um, patients who have severe pain, unilateral pain, this is one of the first things that comes to their mind. But I would really caution uh, giving the diagnosis of this. Uh, certainly, it, it can change people's lives. And they might have... Um, inappropriate treatments, and that's all I'm going to leave it at. <laughs> so we want to rule out other conditions before giving this uh, diagnosis. So trigeminal neuralgia is a very specific condition that's related to either a vascular compression of the trigeminal nerve, so the, the artery that's against the nerve is pressing on the nerve, rubbing on the nerve as it kind of pulses. It usually gets 
one or two of the branches of the trigeminal nerve, typically not three. Typically, you're going to have uh, the mandibular and the, um, sorry, the, uh, the maxillary and the mandibular uh, region of the trigeminal nerve are more likely than the occipital region. Um, uh, the pain is unilateral. It's divisional. So again, it's in one or two divisions. And it typically is a sharp shooting, lancinating pain that is the worst pain of their life. Um, some uh, people like to describe this as suicide disease because it is extremely severe. And patients can sometimes think about, um, you know, suicidal ideation with this condition because it's so bad. This pain is significant in the fact that it lasts a very short duration, typically about two seconds to two minutes. And then after eliciting the pain, there's a refractory period. So you cannot elicit it again. This is a very important because it's different than other kinds of pain that don't have a refractory period. So sometimes we like to try to um, engage in a, a pain response with the patient. We ask them what their triggers are. Is it touching the area very gently, like you're, you know, washing your face or putting moisturizer on or shaving or even, you know, kissing or wind, anything like that? We might try to replicate that. And then if uh, we can get that attack, we monitor it, and then we try to see if we can provoke it again. And if we can't, then that's a pretty good indication of possibly an interaction with a trigeminal nerve. Now, of course, there are idiopathic cases. You don't necessarily have to have direct contact of the artery with the nerve, but it can be very useful if you have um, imaging. It can help support that diagnosis. So oftentimes we will get um, certain MRIs of the brain looking at the brainstem area to see if there's an obvious contact between the artery and the nerve that helps us feel a little bit more confident about our diagnosis. And then finally, moving along, we're going to talk about burning mouth syndrome, which I find to be incredibly, incredibly prevalent, especially in the post-COVID times. Uh, for many patients, it's a triad of symptoms. Um, that can be precipitated sometimes by traumatic life events. So it seems to be a location in their mouth of the tip of the tongue, the anterior palate, the lower lip area, possibly the nose or the throat, occasionally in the vulva as well, which is vulvodynia, which is a separate but related condition. And this can feel like a burning, hot coffee, scalded sensation. Patients typically feel like it has a variable intensity. Some people say it's horrible. I cannot live my life like this. Some people say it's just annoying. I really don't like it. The pattern is typically continuous, uh, although sometimes it can get worse when patients are um, less focused on their day-to-day -day tasks. So sometimes at night as they're getting ready to lay down for sleep, they notice, oh man, I can really feel it right now. I can, I have, you know, the ability to focus on that pain and it's really bad. And again, the localization is bilateral symmetric, typically of the nervous pathways. So we have that triad, right? So some patients just have that uh, sensation, the like um, oral dysesthesia sensation of that change in their, their mouth where it doesn't feel quite right. Some patients know a taste per, uh, per, uh, perturbance, like they have a metallic taste or salty taste, a bitter taste, feels wrong, like food doesn't taste as good anymore. And there can also be sensations of dryness with or without salivary gland uh, hypofunction. If you have all three, that's really nice and really helpful, but it's certainly not necessary. Many patients will say that, you know, it just started. I don't know what happened, but, you know, it, it all started right around X, Y, and Z. And that can be really helpful for you to understand. The epidemiology is about... You know, one to four percent of adult patients with many more females affected than males it typically happens kind of pre post perimenopausal, um, usually around three to 12 years after menopause. And again, it can be in that distribution of the tip of the tongue, the sides of the tongue, the lip area that is very uh, replicatable in many patients. But the hard thing for many patients is that they don't see anything inside their mouth or they might start looking in their side their mouths and trying to figure out what is this. And it can be confused with things that are very benign, like um, burning mouth, or sorry, with like a <laughs> geographic tongue or benign migratory glossitis. So this is really a, a diagnosis of exclusion, and we have to do our thorough um, diagnostic evaluation. So looking through and trying to say, okay, there are evidence of obvious hypothalamation. Does the patient possibly have candidiasis that can be um, irritating the mouth? Is there, again, geographic tongue or benign migratory glossitis? 
possibly some sort of um, intrinsic factor problem where they don't have enough vitamin B12 or folate. Do they have allergies to things that they're putting in their mouth? Maybe, you know, a dental allergy, which is possible with certain acrylics, monomers. Uh, does the patient have acid reflux? Is it actually worse in the morning? Some of my patients say, I get this kind of um, film feeling in my mouth and I have coughing going on. And that can actually be related to morning time acid reflux rather than true burning mouth. Some medications like ACE inhibitors also can increase the sensation of burning. Patients who have poorly controlled diabetes can feel this as well. Um, and then less commonly, you know, ill-fielding dentures, oral, or oral carcinomas certainly can give burning sensation. And head and neck radiation in the first week can also give that burning sensation. So we have to go through a proper diagnosis in medical history to understand if patients have these or not. And then moving into our last segment now, let's talk about important diagnoses that we really don't want to miss for patients. Again, we talked about myocardial infarction, patients coming to your office or to the emergency department saying, you know, I feel like I have acid reflux, I feel like I have jaw pain, maybe I have a little bit of tingling going on. You take their blood pressure, their blood pressure sky high. That patient is definitely a concern for myocardial infarction, and we do need to give them a, a quick prompt referral to a medical doctor, preferably in, you know, uh, the emergency or urgent setting. Many patients who present to or facial pain clinics have many multi, uh, mental health medications, and it is possible that they take them incorrectly or they have multiple medications that can give them um, serotonin syndrome, which can present as even you know, mild kind of like GI upset to sweating to even um, seizures and, and terrible, terrible life-threatening illness. So doing a thorough history of what kind of medications patients are on and how they're taking them is important and something that shouldn't be missed. Thunderclap headaches are also very important. Patients will say that they got the worst headache of their life. It came on like a thunderbolt, extremely, extremely strong pain. This can be related to a cerebral artery dissection. It can be related to hemorrhage in the brain, and we don't want to miss this. This can be um, life-ending, unfortunately. These patients need to be referred as well. Temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis, excuse me, my voice is going, <coughs> can be related to um, a jaw claudication, meaning like tiredness sensation, with chewing. So they feel like they can't really finish chewing very well because they get tired while chewing. They can have sensitivity when you touch on the temporal artery. They can also have um, uh, almost like gangrenous changes or um, loss of uh, blood supply to the oral mucous membranes. I've seen patients who've had what looked like a large ulcer, necrotic ulcer on the tongue in association with um, giant cell arteritis. So definitely looking in the mouth and putting those together can be important. These patients can have blindness, so we, we need to make sure that we refer them very promptly if that's a concern. And then obviously patients who are in significant emotional distress can have suicidal ideation as well. Or if they stop their medication, um, they also can have suicidal ideation. So we really do want to uh, make sure we ask appropriate questions. If patients' affects seem to be off, we ask, you know, are you considering dying by suicide? Do you have a plan? Do you have a means to complete this plan? And when do you plan to do this? And these questions, while they may feel very invasive, are can be life-saving. There's been some studies that, you know, patients do seek help, but they might not actually get the help because we're not asking the right questions. And you can save a life if you do see that they're a patient affect is different. And then just for um, prognosis for many patients, if they've had a history of many failed treatments, <coughs> sorry, multiple prior providers or pending litigation, this might be a sign that this patient is extremely complex. They really do need the care of a provider that is a specialist in oral facial pain because it is kind of a a rocky road to navigate. These patients do deserve care. They do deserve um, management by an expert, but it can be very difficult for somebody who is not formally trained to help many of these patients. And then finally, who do we refer to? Who do we play well with? Our medical colleagues in neurology are very important, obviously, for any sort of imaging of the body or brain rheumatology, for joint destructive disorders, concerns about temporal arteritis as well. Um, otorhinolaryngologists can be very important too for any concerns about sinus infections or things in the ears, uh, things in the nose. 
pain medicine can be helpful. Patients are not doing well with their pain protocol or there's concern about opioid misuse. Pain psychology additionally can be helpful for improving the way patients um, cope with their pain condition. Physical therapy can be helpful in the hands of an appropriately trained provider. Uh, we want to make sure that these patients are getting appropriate therapy and not over therapy. And I hope Dr. Kraster will talk about that a little bit. Some of our patients require um, help from a movement disorders clinic because some medications may uh, uh, give them some movement disorders or they might have movement disorders from underlying health conditions that can be treated. And then sleep medicine colleagues also can be very helpful for obtaining polysomnogram to decide if we need to be doing any sort of sleep disorder breathing um, appliances or treatments. Our dental colleagues in endodontics obviously are experts at diagnosing if the teeth are actually really the problem. Oral medicine is an expert of the tissue diseases. Oral surgery can be helpful if we decide to triage a patient up to getting a surgical procedure. And oral radiology can be very helpful for interpreting our CBCTs, our MRI, MRIs, and our panoramic radiographs if we feel uncomfortable. And I think my voice is about to go. Um, my last little bit that I'm just going to say right now, this is a really lovely article that was just published in JADA. Um, the AAOP asked its members to talk about their um, experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. And many... Um, Surveys were returned, and basically 33% of practitioners noticed that the onset of patient pain may have been uh, related to COVID-19. And the conditions most commonly aggravated were masticatory myalgia, anxiety, tension-type headache, flexism, and uh, poor sleep condition, insomnia. So in this kind of post-COVID tail end, uh, this is a kind of a booming area, right? Oral facial pain is greatly needed. I certainly have noticed a lot more patients with burning mouth, a lot more patients with masticatory myalgia, a lot more patients that need help from our um, colleagues and from experts in the field. And so I would just say, you know, this is a really exciting time to be in oral facial pain. You know, we're recognized now. We know we can help. And I think that we're getting the, um, the, the, the patients understand that they need our help, essentially. So on that note, I just want to say thank you very much to the American Academy of Oral Facial Pain, my esteemed colleagues at USC, LIJ, and the Brigham, who have all taught me incredibly well. I just want to say Dr. Vistoso, who showed up, who is one of my colleagues at USC. I'm so honored to be your peer. And obviously, I think my, my parents are here, so I just want to say thank you to my family. Um, truly, I, I would not be here without the support of an entire village, and it is my great honor to speak to all of you. So this is my contact information if any of you have any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to take a brief water break. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, that, was, that was wonderful. It is, uh, I, I still am, am, uh, have fun watching these and, and enjoying these webinars where it doesn't matter how many times I, I hear these things, I, I pick them a new pearl each time. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I recognize many of those forms from good old USC. Um, but let us move on to the, the panel portion. Um, so I'll introduce um, my, my uh, co-chair for the conference this year, um, Dr. Mariona uh, Moulet. Uh, she is an oral facial pain specialist uh, in Minnesota. She's the associate program director of the oral facial pain graduate program at the University of Minnesota and provides patient care as an oral facial pain specialist at Health Partners Dental Group in Minnesota. Dr. Moulet earned her dental degree from the University of Barcelona in 1998, and she then completed her oral facial pain residency training and master's degree at the University of Minnesota in 2003. Dr. Millette is a diplomate of the American Board of Oral Facial Pain, as well as a diplomate of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. Dr. Millette. Good morning. Thank you, Alex. And uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you, uh, Dr. Henderson, for a very uh, informative presentation. Uh, we're going to move on to our uh, Q&A, and I would invite our panelists to uh, turn their cameras on if they haven't done so, uh, and I will be introducing them. We'll be also uh, taking questions from the audience, uh, so 
please feel free to uh, write those on your uh, on the Q&A window so we can address those in the uh, next few minutes here. Uh, I will uh, start by introducing uh, Dr. Annette Vistoso. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, Dr. Vistoso is a board certified or official pain specialist. Uh, she is an assistant professor of clinical dentistry at the University of Southern California. Uh, she received her DDS from the University of Chile, uh, completed a Master's of Science in Artificial Pain and Oral Medicine, and an Advanced Program Certificate in Prostodontics from the Universidad del Desarrollo, as well as a Certificate Program in Artificial Pain from USC, and Advanced Clinical Training Program in Oral Medicine at UCSF. Uh, her research is focused on precision or official, or, or official sciences with the application of artificial intelligence in the fields of artificial pain and oral medicine. Uh, good morning, Dr. Vistoso, and thank you for being here. Next, we'll, uh, uh, I'll introduce Dr. Gary Glasser. He is a professor in the Department of Diagnostic Sciences at Louisiana State University School of Dentistry. He is a fellow and past president of the American Academy of Official Pain, uh, completed his official pain graduate studies at the University of Kentucky, and later a fellowship in oral medicine, oral oncology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Glasser has published uh, numerous peer-reviewed scientific articles and contributed to many chapters to various textbooks. He is the co-editor of the most recent uh, or official pain guidelines, which will be available to the public very soon. And he will also be our speaker, um, our next webinar on April 15th, uh, for anybody who would like to attend. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Glasser. Good morning to all. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson, for providing us with a uh, uh, whirlwind, if you will, uh, presentation covering a vast topic. So thank you very much for a wonderful, enlightening presentation. Thank you. And lastly, Dr. Jeff Okeson, good morning. Um, good, uh, Dr. Okeson is Professor and Dean of the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry. He is also the founder of the school's official pain program, which he established in 1977. Uh, Dr. Okeson has more than uh, 240 publications in the area of occlusion, temporomandibular disorders, and official pain in various national and international journals. He is past president of both the American Academy of Official Pain and the American Board of Official Pain. And he has authored two textbooks on temporomandibular disorders and official pain, uh, which have been translated into 11 different languages. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Okeson. Thank you, Dr. Murray. And I also would like to compliment Dr. Henderson. What a wonderful job. This is what triple board certification tells you about. I mean, is it oral medicine? Is it oral facial pain? Is it is it oral pathology? And it's a lovely presentation on how they all mix together. You can't separate these things as well as 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 well as all pain conditions. All pain stretches, all dentistry, as well as all medicines. So this is how broad we have to be. And you did a wonderful job presenting that. Thank you very much, Dr. Henderson. Agreed. And uh, maybe we'll move on to uh, reading the questions we have from the audience. Try, we'll try to get to as many as possible, okay? Uh, the first one uh, uh, is about the financial cost of or official pain to a patient. Is there a breakdown of the expenses such as pharmacology, treatment, et cetera? So what does uh, or official pain cost to our patients? Who would like to take that answer? Anybody who would like to start? I think that it's a very difficult question to answer, to be honest. Every patient is so different. The diagnoses are completely different. The prognosis is different. To be able to generalize that across patients, a lot of variables. So I wish we had great data on that. But I would say maybe, you know, if, if you wanted to talk about one condition, you know, what does headache look like or what does jaw pain look like? That might be an easier answer. And maybe my uh, contemporaries can tell me what they know, but certainly that's too hard for me. I don't know. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think, um, and we all are in agreement, all members of the panel here, in managing these patients in a fairly conservative, reversible manner. You know, when you compare that to 
I'll say other schools of thought. I think everybody probably has seen the um, event that occurred on CBS News with the AGA uh, device. Um, uh, we try and do it on an evidence-based manner, which often will be, uh, it's not uncostly, but it's certainly not the cost or the complications that can occur when people are mismanaged or mistreated, be it by not so well-intentioned individuals or even well-intentioned individuals who may follow a more aggressive, invasive approach uh, to management of oral facial pain conditions. Uh, I would like to contribute some thoughts here. In, in our setting at the University of Kentucky, as well as most others, the average person we see now is probably had three, three and a half, almost four years of treatment before they arrive. Now, if you ask the cost for those individuals, unbelievable. And, you know, they have been everywhere. They've had all kinds of things done, none of which have worked. What it gets down to? Misdiagnosis, often. They've been treating for many disorders they don't have. And it's very costly to them. If, you know, if we could just narrow it down and be a better diagnostician and just focus on what the diagnosis is, we would save a lot of people a lot of money, you know, and, and maintaining, as, as Dr. Klasser just said, and will say next time we get together, is the conservative approach is so reasonable for most patients like this. And, and we can do that to so many people and save everybody a lot of money and time. So, but it's difficult to know, just like Dr. Henderson, it's just difficult to know what the diagnosis it is and how much effort it takes to solve that problem and and some of these um strategies provided by these individuals are provided by very well-intentioned individuals they're not just educated enough unfortunately which makes this seminar series the seminar that will be available on thursday at our aop meeting our aop meeting um and other educational endeavors that our organizations wants to present uh, more available and have practitioners more open to um, uh, joining us for these particular sessions. Education is the key. Yeah. And education in our dental schools is the key. And I know Dr. Okeson is a dean and I know at UK at University of Kentucky, they're very well informed, but unfortunately, um, and I'm sure when Dr. Okeson, you may want to comment on this, when you meet with your fellow deans at your dean's meeting, not every school in the United States, and I'm only speaking for the United States, has an oral facial pain uh, practitioner uh, as part of their faculty. Oh, and you're muted. While she's getting unmuted, I will say, I will say, for years and years and years, we worked behind the scene with the Commission Dental Accreditation to require, to require the teaching of TM disorders. Interesting enough, the second most common pain condition that we dentists face is TMD, musculoskeletal pain, and there's, there was no universal system where everybody was teaching it. It wasn't even required by the Commission Dental Accreditation. The Commission Dental Accreditation. So, in the last two years, it's been required. So, we're starting to see hopefully, a move towards everybody getting educated in, in the dental field before graduation. Uh, that's really important. Yeah. I, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yeah. So I think the, the takeaway message that we, we can give today with in, in this uh, question is like, actually, our treatment is not that expensive. The previous treatment and the, the, the step for the patient to get to, uh, to treat with our official pain specialist is the more expensive part. For us, like Dr. Glasser said and Dr. Okeson, and I think we all agree, is mostly we educate the patient and many of the, our conditions that we see can be prevented before to get like a, something more difficult to treat, before any surgical procedure, before anything that could uh, take uh, or cost more money. So at this point, what we want to like try to reflect is like actually we can educate the patient, we can educate our colleague, and we can have like like less patient affected. And, and of course, that will be like less expensive um, treatment for our patients. So I think that's the, 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 the takeaway message here. 
All right, can I, I'll just add a final thought too, and that is that in many states, uh, the services that oral facial pain specialists provide can be built through medical insurance. Even though we are a dental specialty, we uh, prov- we do our billing through medical insurance. So oftentimes, these patients are covered for uh, the management of their conditions, and uh, uh, I think this is a great uh, great advantage to our field, uh, so we can provide these patients with the care they deserve. You want to move on to the next question, maybe, uh, Dr. Bond, you want to take that one? Yeah. Next. So the, the next one, um, I, I'm going to, just for brevity's sake, there's, they're quoting two, um, uh, or I guess one article about uh, kind of the progression of, of disc displacement with reduction towards, uh, without reduction. Um, and then can you comment on the progression of that, of, of, of going from a, a non-reducing, or I'm sorry, a reducing disc to a non-reducing disc over time? Well, I can talk about some of the long-term studies that we have available. And Dr. Rini DeLeo has got 30-year follow-ups on patients. We've got others that are doing this. So if you take you take a look at this condition, when we first started understanding it, we felt, oh, my goodness, if this is going to be there, it's going to be worse and worse, and pretty soon arthritis at the end of this transition. And that is not the natural course of this disorder. The natural course of this disorder is for adaptation. Nature has been treating this joint way longer than dentists have been treating this joint. You set up the right environment, and most of the times these tissues will, in fact, adapt. And with adaptation, they may still have some clicking, and maybe even limitation of opening resolves over time when you look at all the long-term studies. So this this is not necessarily progressive. It doesn't mean it can't be, and there are individuals that it could be more vulnerable for maybe from the biology. They're not as good adapter. If we can reduce some loading and change some loading, almost, in my opinion, most patients are going to adapt. And therefore, they've already adapted sometimes by the time it's noticed. And then somebody takes an MRI and go, oh, my gosh, no, 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 no. that's adaptation. Leave it alone. I, I think very often we see diagnosis by radiograph uh, and not diagnosis by patient management on these on these patients. Patients will get sent to us. My dentist said uh, that I have a problem in my jaw because of what's on the radiograph. And I ask the patient, okay, what's wrong with the jaw? And they go, well, I don't know, but my dentist said there was something. It's like, okay, there's nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, we have to remember symptoms. Symptoms run the show, not not necessarily radiographic appearance. And and sometimes we have to, I'll say, de-educate our patients mm-hmm. from myths that exist. And you know, everybody uses Doctor Google and Doctor YouTube because they are the uh, mavens of uh, all medical and dental care provided. And um, it's sad to see the amount of myths or disinformation related to TMD on those two particular sites. So, you know, again, um, as Dr. Vistoso said, education, number one thing. When I did my residency in Kentucky, and I do it to this day, many years after I have graduated, the number one thing on my management strategy, education reassurance, always number one. So. I think one of the highlights of my education at USC was the, um, emphasis on the way that we deliver message messages and choosing our words very carefully. So it can be very easy to suggest diseases to people and say, oh, I've heard of this before. You probably have this. And for many patients, that can be very problematic. They have this almost implanted disease that they never even heard of before. And now I have to go figure this out. So we really want to be specific with our words and, and use proper diagnosis um, and, and language to describe what's going on. We can make things a lot worse by saying the incorrect words. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we're not implanting disease in patients and saying, oh, this is the worst joint I've ever seen. Oh my gosh, you got to get this, that, and the other done. Like it's conservative, therapeutic language that works best. (laughs) Uh, A a good colleague of mine and friend, Dr. Chuck Green, uh, has made a profound statement. TMDs are not discovered. They are reported. And I, you know, adhere to that to this day. And for any of you, you've got to hear some of Dr. Uh, Green's pearls because they are definitely pearls. (laughs) Uh All right. I think I will uh, read the next question. And for uh, uh, time reasons here, I'm going to combine two questions. Um, Thank you for the interesting presentation. Which type of provider should a patient experiencing multiple issues, migraine, tension, headache, TMJ, jaw muscle, pain, which uh, provider should they seek? What specialist? Is it an oral surgeon? 
And the next question that I'm going to combine this with is, do you have any advice for finding an orofacial pain specialist in your area? I, I, those are perfectly combined because that's the answer. Um, <laughs> I, I think realistically, those are just all orofacial pain conditions. And, and, and that's not to say that that we're the only specialist that treats these things. Obviously, two headache disorders are listed there. And I think the natural course for, for a headache referral is neurology. Um, but certainly we can come along. I know, I know I'm good friends with the local neurologist that's the, the headache specialist in the, in the region. We constantly referring back and forth. Um, I, I think that's, that's going to be your, your first stop. Usually if you can, um, get that referral. And then as to how, um, to two ways, you can go to, uh, AAOP's website. There's a member directory. Um, on that member directory, you can search both, both, um, by fellow. So if you're looking at a fellow, you know, they're board certified. Uh, or, or generally board certified, I should say. Uh, but uh, the other options are members. Most of the AAOP member dentists that aren't necessarily specialists are, are, are also, though, a good source for those patients to at least get some knowledge if there's no specialist in your area. Um, the other route you can go is abop.net. That's, that's AB as in board, American Board of Orofacial Pain. Um, and that will list a, 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 a list of all the diplomates. Um, again, I think those are going to be where I normally refer people when they move to another area, I say, hey, check these websites and, and find someone. So uh -huh. one has to remember, you know, uh, orofacial pain and with the subsection of TMD uh, is a multifactorial, multi-etiological problem that often requires a multidisciplinary or di interdisciplinary approach. You know, having said that, you've got to build a network of colleagues if you're going to treat these orofacial pain people, and it's up to you to seek out ones that A, share your same philosophy and are competent and wanting to manage these kind of patients. So you got to do some homework. <laughs> uh, my comments would be that, that when a patient will come to the orofacial pain dentist with multiple conditions, you just listed five or six conditions. What you have to figure out is not only is what's the relationship between this, if there is relationship, sometimes there's not, sometimes there definitely is. What's the primary? What's the secondary? And then also, I think, ask what is the complaint that's most disturbing to you, disabling to you? Is it headache? Is it the jaw pain? Is it the neck pain? Is it is it the electrical shooting pain? And then you take a look at those and say, okay, now which one? That's the one I, this patient needs to be addressed the best. And if I address that one, maybe I'll also get some of the secondary conditions that, that are related to that away. And then am I in a position to make a difference with that condition? And if that's if that's purely neurology, and maybe you're not as, not, not as comfortable with neurology, maybe you get to the neurologist. But I will share with you that my experience over the years as a neurologist are not great pain people. You know, they're not, tr you'd think the neurologist should be the expert in pain. I have not found that. You know, in fact, everything is trigeminal neurology to the neurologist, you know, which is <laughs> means which means pain in the trigeminal nerve. Okay, all of this could be considered that way. But so, uh, so I would like to think that we oral facial pain would gather enough information that we feel comfortable with some of the neuropathic conditions. You know, comfortable with migraine, comfortable with these things, which which we which we are eligible to treat and should treat. But if but if it's not in the area and that's a primary complaint, then you look for that specialty and see if they can get to that person. Exactly. In fact, there are some um, conditions, like, for example, autoimmune condition that we need to like work very uh, um, close with rheumatologies. Um, th those, I think, that are our best ally because in the, the autoimmune conditions, those are many, many treatments that we cannot like give to the patient, like infusion, like biologic. So we need to like work very close with them. And that's something that we need to study like in, uh, like, uh, in detail because they are very complex conditions. And like Dr. Okeson say, they never come with one diagnosis, they come with different diagnoses. So we need to know which is our part. Our part in this case, I will take care of a patient with scleroderma or a patient with MMP or a patient with um, rheumatoid arthritis, like the muscle pain, the, the jaw pain. But I cannot take care of like the psoriatic arthritis. That will be taken care of by, by the rheumatologist. So we need to know our part. And we need to know where we need to ask for help and when we need to like collaborate and communicate that the communication with the colleagues and in, in this case, I think is key because if we don't know what the other is doing, we are just giving like misinformation to the patient and the patient get confused and then they, they miss the point. 
So I think the most important thing here for me is always like education, communication, like basically language, you know, it's mostly like the treatment for my patient is like the language, even with the colleague and with the patient. I think that's uh, important. Great point. I just want to put this out there as just like asking the universe for it, but I would love to get an oral facial pain specialist in every hospital. I think that would be incredible to have for the emergency department, for referrals, for somebody down the hall, be like, hey, I don't know what kind of headache this is. Can you come take a look at my patient? I don't know if that's possible, but like just visioning for the future, I think that that intersection of medicine and dentistry is so perfect for oral facial pain, and we really should be advocating for our presence in that space. Absolutely. Let's hope. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hopefully we get there someday. Um, one more question about uh, protocol for BMS patients. Uh, can you share your protocol? That's I think we should wait for Dr. Klasser's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, again, uh, it is a often, I I think the key with BMS is more at the, uh, diagnostic part by, uh, ruling out all other possibilities. And Dr. Henderson alluded to that. Once you get into the world of management strategies for BMS, um, there are many doors open and, and I think you have to tailor make your management strategy for burning mouth disorder patients, whatever term we want to use, uh, more specifically to that individual. So, you know, again, um, like anything that we do, there is no boilerplate. If you walk in with this, you get this. We have to tailor make and individualize our treatment depending on that patient's needs, both from what they're taking currently pharmacologically, but for their emotional and social well-being as well. So it's hard to just say, you know, um, here's the cookbook. Oral facial pain is not cookbook. Dentistry is step A, B, C, D, E. And maybe that's why all of us left general dentistry to go into oral facial pain because the thinking process, and as Dr. Oakson told me when I became a resident, this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Oakson, this is a thinking man's game or thinking person's game. I want to be politically correct. Um, so hard to provide a protocol. It's a thinking sport is what I said, Gary. Sorry, <laughs> thinking sport. I got, yeah, I'm getting old. You know, my <laughs> cognitive abilities are deteriorating. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, would anybody uh, like to touch on the patho- pathobiological mechanism of PTTN and the main risk factors? Post-traumatic like we're, this is a, this is a, this is like a, a board, like we're doing our board exam again. <laughs> oral board. We're, back, we're back in it. Um, I, I will tell you that, that, that this is, is for me, for sure, a, a, a um, not going to be something where I can give you the exact uh, mechanism quickly. I can tell you that the main thing I remember from my, uh, on the risk factor side was fairly interesting that the number one risk factor is a history of pain um, or, or pain in the area to begin with is the number one risk factor. And that's where uh, Laura was getting at with the multiple serial treatments. Um, when when you keep compounding with pain on pain on pain, uh, we do run run running into that a little bit more. That the mechanism is, as far as I can remember, is, is still poorly understood, but thought to be mainly a central central sensitization behind a portion of it, and partially peripheral, um, which is why it's so complex to treat. Is, is we have some upregulation in the sodium channels as well as some um, some at the, the the first and second order neuron level, if I remember correctly, but. Uh, again, we're, we're, you're pulling, you're trying to pull me out some board questions that, that I've, 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 uh, I've unfortunately probably, uh, traumatically hidden. <laughs> so I, I, I tell my patients, uh, I mean, unfortunately, and I'm brutally honest with my patients, we are in, we are at our infancy and in understanding the mechanisms behind why you have what you have when it comes to a trigeminal neuropathy. You know, uh, we're just not smart enough yet. Now, maybe in the year 2020, uh, uh, I mean, 22, 20, whatever, 
uh, I won't be here. Maybe we'll have the answers. We'll be very Star Trekian. Um, I'm, I don't know if that's a word, but uh, we may or may not get there. But right now we're not there. So understanding why it happened to you, other than saying the stars, the sun, and the moon aligned for you incorrectly that day is about as good as I can get, you know? Um, and that's being truthful. We, we don't understand. Uh, there is not much research being done, unfortunately, specifically on trigeminal neuropathies. And when you look at how do we manage this, we extrapolate everything from post-herpetic neuralgia and diabetic peripheral neuropathy, which may or may not be very good models to use for trigeminal neuropathy. Now, I tell my patients, it's hard to ask a rat you know, if they're having, say, burning pain on their tongue. I don't speak rats, so I'm not very good at communicating with them. So, you know, we're, we'll get better, but science moves very slowly. We have a few pieces to a 10,000-piece puzzle. I, I think what Gary, Dr. Klasser just said is accurate. And the thing is, this is an area that we're all trying to deal with, with very little scientific evidence. And so we're extrapolating ideas. But the important part here is that we've got to admit to that to the patients because some docs Mm -hmm. can't admit, I don't know. That's the worst thing in the world. And that means they're going to do something wrong. So what I I do similar to what what Gary just said, I'll sit with the patient and I'll say something like this. I've got some good news. I've got some bad news. The good news is I know what you've got. I I, I know what it, you're not, you're not crazy. This is, you're not making it up. Because many of these patients have already been thrown in office saying, you're crazy, get out of my office. I think that's the worst thing in the world you could bring to the human spirit to say, you're making this up. Because I haven't met too many people who are making it up, you know. And so the good news is, here's what we call it. What's the bad news? The bad news is we're still not smart enough now to know how to turn this thing all the way off. We've got things that will help. We've got some medicines that will help. We can maybe I'll take you from a 7 out of 10 to a 2 out of 10. It may be then you'll get a better quality of life. You'll be able to go back to work. You'll you'll have all these other things, but but it'll still be there. And in the evening when you're trying to go to sleep, you go, oh, it's still there. You know, that's the best I think we can do if it's truly one of these continuous neuropathic pains felt. If there's a peripheral input, maybe we have a little bit more of topical things. If it's central, we got the medicines, but none of that has been adequate to solve everybody's problem all the time. And and that's where we are. And patients need to know that. Because they're afraid they'll go to somebody and they'll fix it by doing something that's unrelated, and that, and that's wrong. I think I think you're seeing we all have our own ways that we're like Laurel was saying. It, it's all about how you talk to the patient, and we all I think have those uh, ways that we explain things that may may help the patients out better. And and I think a lot of this humility and admitting that we don't know. Um, I always highlight to my patients that that well, not always. Over the last year, I have. Uh, that that it was what, late 21, I think, or early 22, where we just, that, you know, they discovered a, a third belly to the mass of the muscle. And I always joke with my patients that, that the very first form of medicine and science was pretty much dissecting people and seeing what was in there. And we still don't know the anatomy. I mean, it's been thousands of years that we've been studying anatomy and we still don't know it all. Um, and, and that's the easiest thing to learn, right? What's there? And so if we can't even figure out what's there, uh, collectively and, and agree on that. Certainly the why is, is still a ways away, but we can, we can, you know, manage and, and do what we can. There are going to be things that we learn. There's going to be things I do today that five years from now, we're going to have dramatically different answers for. Um, and I think when you're honest with your patients, I think it helps them a whole lot more than if you come in with the mindset of, I know everything, this is great. You're going to be perfect. Cause then when you fail, you are the one, the do- doctor uh, is, is the one that failed. And realistically we're going to, and we need to be okay with that. Well, it, it looks like we're running out of time here. So if anybody has any final thoughts, uh, this would be the time. Um, otherwise, I, I think Dr. Oakson uh, in his initial presentation said something very profound and, um, you know, always follow the individual seeking the truth, but don't follow the individual who knows all the answers. I may have butchered that up, but, you know, something to that. So, you know, by us admitting we don't know everything, you know, it's okay to say I don't know is very comforting to patients, you know, as opposed to somebody who says, I've got all the answer. Let's get you to the operating room and let's start cutting in the back of their mind going, I don't know what I'm cutting, but I'm going to cut because, you know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Yep. That's right. 
But I think it's important also to know and the, the, the audience to know that we are working on it. We are trying to do more research. We are focused on get, get, gather all this information. We have to do a, a lot of retrospective studies to, to start to see what actually we were doing, what we we're doing like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. What, how can we change this? So it's not like we say we don't know and that's it. We, know, we don't know and we want to know. And that's our job right now. Like We are trying to, to figure out how actually the things are presenting. Many of these conditions that you, Laurel, say that, of course, she did that wonderful representation i'm very proud of you <laughs> but actually it, these conditions are very symptomatic we don't see signs it's not like in oral medicine we see the lesion we see the the, the tumor we see the the ulcer in this case it's just basically patient history so we need to gather the information very well so if we the patient is not is not very clear um doing the story for us it's hard to to uh, to understand but if we know very well what we are looking for we will understand the patient better so i think this is a like i said i i will just for my, my summary will be like education communication and basically more research in this area that's why we are trying to do right now Great. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, to our presenter, Dr. Laurel Henderson, for a wonderful presentation today. Thank you to our panelists to, uh, for being here and providing with uh, very meaningful contributions uh, to my co-chair, Dr. Vaughn. Uh, thank you to all the attendees for joining us on this Saturday morning. Sorry that we were not able to get to all the questions, um, but you can easily uh, reach any of us. Uh, I would encourage you to go to the AOP website, aaop.org, for information about uh, members, uh, providers in different states, uh, further educational opportunities. Uh, we have three years of uh, recorded presentations uh, that are available on the website for anybody who uh, registers. Um, we will have the annual meeting uh, coming up uh, the first weekend of May, Thursday through Sunday, 4th through 8th. Uh, with uh, including an official pain introductory program for any of those who would be interested in, in getting more involved in, in managing our official pain patients. And then, of course, we have one more webinar on this series on April 15th, uh, uh, taught by Dr. Gary Klasser on evidence-based treatments or management strategies for official pain disorders. Uh, so more to come. Um, we could keep talking about these things forever. <laughs> I wish we had more time, but uh, I think this is uh, this is it for today. So anybody else that uh, uh, Alex, thank you for uh, helping today, and uh, we will see you uh, all soon. Thank you all. Have a all right. Day. Looking forward to next month's presentation. <laughs>